either for yourself or for us to share with other people. That's what our message is going to be about today, is sharing the message given in this church with those out and around and about us. And then the, the uh, Pilgrim Bend uh, monetary contribution are much appreciated. So if you have some that you can donate to Pilgrim Bend that could help the ones who are less fortunate, I know that's greatly appreciated because you know as people of God, we are called to share and to help those who are least fortunate. So I want to again want to thank you and welcome. And at uh, this time, we will have Marvin and Mateo come up with a praise service. Then after that, Brother Tim is going to have a song. guitar today because I was sharp the blades on the tent on the tents on my lawnmower and the grinder the grinding wheel slipped and almost cut my finger off. But I'm thankful for the Lord that he stopped the grinder before he cut my finger off. And number two, I'm thankful for the Lord how fast the healing has been taking place. Amen. Uh, it doesn't hurt. I got a little numbness at the end of it, but it's I'm so thankful to the Lord. So here you go. Playing against the chords. My finger. I don't need this one. <laughs> so, I'm so thankful today to the Lord for His goodness to us. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
privilege for us to be here today. So privileged to have given us an invitation, Lord, to be in your presence. Lord, you love us with an everlasting love. And Lord, I just want to thank you and praise you for all that you do for each and every one of us. I pray you send the Holy Spirit to be with us today. Lord, open our hearts and our minds. Lord, just abide with us and us with you. I just pray, Lord, that you will fill our cups full and that we will love you with all that we are. And Lord, just be with all the churches around the world and bless them as well, Lord. We just leave these things in your care. Lord, we ask all these things. Let's express hallelujah, that one who was wounded to heal the body, the mind, and the spirit from the sea of sickness. Please, sing with me the hymn number 245, More About Jesus. Hymn number 245, More About Jesus. Senior 
simply could not refuse. The Los Angeles Express newspaper promised Pastor Richard several free 15-minute slots of radio time each week if he would place weekly advertising for his tent meetings in their paper. Always wanting to embrace new methods to reach souls, the 35-year-old Richards jumped at the chance. On October 19, 1929, only days before the Great Depression hit, Richards was on the air, sharing the hope of Jesus with the people of Southern California. By World War II, the Voice of Prophecy had become the first religious coast-to-coast -coast broadcast in North America on the usual broadcast casting network. That same year, in 1942, it launched a Spanish language broadcast that later would be called La Voz de la Esperanza. More North Americans access radio regularly than any other major media format. 88% of Canadians report having listened to radio in any given month, while 93% of Americans say they listen to radio every week. Online audio also remains <coughs> a fast-growing market. As millions turn to digital platforms for more engaging content, as listeners tune in week by week, they are invited to go deeper with the Lord through radio ministries. Bible schools, and evangelistic events. Day by day and week by week, the power of radio evangelism continues to change lives. Please join today in giving generously to support the ministry of the Voice of Prophecy and La Voz de la Esperanza. It is all of us in response to all of the pain. If I ask your sister,
is now time for our, our anthem. All the candles deal at this time. <coughs>
And whether you are trying to share Jesus with your family who seem to oppose your message, rest assured Jesus has you right in his hand. You are very special to him. Very special to Jesus. He will take care of you in your ministry, and your ministry will be prosperous. You may find your ministry in a difficult place, but you're right in the hands of Jesus. Let us pray. Lord, Father God, just be with us, Lord, as we go through this message. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is true and it never changes. Father, we just pray that our hearts be open to the Holy Spirit, Lord, and that you'll continue, Lord, just to be with us. Lord, may all that we say and do be to glorify your name. For you love us very much, unconditionally, and Father, we love you and thank you for, for being our friend. The three angels of Revelation 14 make up the message that was given to the seventh day and his church to give in this world. The message of these angels go out after the rise of the United States in Revelation 13, the beast that come out of the earth. So this was fit the time prophecy. Thus I believe that the members of the seventh day and his church are the three angels of Revelation 14. To narrow this down, the three angels' message are who? You and I. Or you and I spread that message, give it to the church. And the seventh day at this church has a very important message to give to the world. So let's see what it is. Turning your Bible to the book of Revelation, chapter 14. Verses 6 and 7. I'm going to read this again. Um, I think they're going to be on the screen. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment, his judgment, has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, sea and the springs of water. So it's his judgment. But you know, don't all churches have the gospel? You know, many people will be in the kingdom from other denominations, from other religions, because the truth of God's word will go out. And those truly seeking Jesus will adhere to his last day message. Some may, some may not. Some even here today may, and some may not. I told myself. I hope I'm quite not. You know, in the book of Revelation, it changes from the dark ages to the earth being lightened with the glory of God. The gospel will shine brighter than ever before. The everlasting gospel of the Seventh-day Adventist Church shares, overcomes the legalism of Babylon. The last message is filled with grace and the glory of God, and not only the works of man, it shows the love of God more clearly than the gospel presented by most other churches. You know, a lot of churches, they, they preach that Jesus died for us, and they turn around and tell us people really don't die. In that case, if Jesus didn't really die, and if he didn't really die, then he did not die for us. You will turn, well, maybe first we all know John 3, 16. We'll turn there. <coughs> and it says there, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I know again I mentioned this before some, some translation says shall not perish. Well we should not perish. We'll have that choice. Many churches preach that sinners will be eternally tormented in hell while John 3, 3.16 which is the core of the gospel says that sinners will what? perish they will die sinners will perish Romans 6 
chapter 6, verse 23. Let's look at that. In Romans 6, 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal life through who? Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, it says that the wages of sin is death, not eternal torment in hell. It's impossible to fall in love with a God who has a lovely or I'll torment you forever, eternity in hell mentality. That's not who God is. While sin and those who cling to it at any cost must perish, God will not be delighted in their eternal torture. This punishment is death, eternal. The punishing is not. Any church is focused on the physical torture Jesus endured. The physical was terrible. Jesus suffered way more than a six hour pain endurance marathon, six hours. I was telling Amy last night, I said, you know, when I go back to the book of Mark and look at that, it talked about the time he was tortured, the time he was on the cross, and the sky was dark, and you know, he was tortured for six hours, and it lasted for six hours, but what happened the seventh hour? He rested. Yes. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9, we'll look there. Hebrews 2 9. And uh, so we see Jesus who was made a little, a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. That he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. He tastes death for everyone. Jesus tastes death for all men. It's obvious it's not the death of the righteous that he tasted. We all taste that first death for ourselves. Obadiah 16 tells us that the wicked will be as though they were never were. Jesus faced more than nailed, scarred hands and feet on the cross. He tasted the death of the wicked, which means he experienced total separation from God on that cross. This could be why he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do we ever sometimes really fathom that in our mind of what Christ went through? It's horrific. Matthew chapter 1 verse 21 tells us that Matthew 1 21 says and he will bring forth a son and you should call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. You know in other denominations they believe that yeah Jesus died Jesus died to save us from our sins and not in our sins. Okay? From our sins and not in our sins. That is very clear. And, you know, we, can, we can't call Jesus a Savior unless we accept him as Savior and by so we are saved by grace. You can look at that, you know, we're studying the book of Ephesians. <coughs> Read that from Ephesians 1 through 10. We're saved by grace. What grace saved us from is our sinful life. So we see Seventh-day Adventists not only teach the different day of worship, we also teach the fullness of the gospel. Our job describes being messengers for Jesus is to let the whole world know the love of Jesus. To let the whole world know the love of Jesus. Means we need to know the love of Jesus. We need to know. You know, we all have our problems and our issues, but we need to know the love of Jesus in our hearts. We need to pray for one another continually. Intercessors prayer. We need to pray for one another. 
You don't have to be a TV evangelist to have a ministry and share this message. This gospel is so amazing that many will not even believe it when they hear it or read about it. However, they will believe it when they see this principle of self-sacrificing love manifested in your life. When they see it in your life, they'll believe it. God can change everyone. Amen. We just got to open our hearts and self has got to be gone. There is a living God and he is there. Soon, as these people are going to see. We're going to go into the first angel's message on Revelation 14 7. So if you'd like to turn to Revelation 14 7. Sam with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. The angel is telling us, is telling us of the judgment which began, we know it began in 1844. Interestingly, the angel says the hour of his judgment, God's judgment has come. What does this mean? It means God is the one being judged. God's the one being judged. The judgment is not to see if God accepts us. Ephesians 1 6 tells us that we already, we are already accepted by the beloved. The judgment is to see if we accept God. See, if we accept God. The seventh day Adventist preaches a time of probation, but many do not realize it is actually God is on probation. Have you ever thought of it that way? God is being judged by the universe. God is God the main controlling freaking tyrant that Satan makes him out to be, or is he a God of love? Is God a good God or some psychopath saying, love me or I will kill you? Satan first attacked the character of God in heaven in Revelation 12. It says that there was war in heaven. But with, and what was machine guns and tanks or nothing like that? It was a battle of the minds. Satan wanted God's power. However, Satan did not want his character. He wanted his power, but not his character. You know, I can see Satan playing games with the angels. I can see him going up to a, one of the angels saying, you know, you've done a great job on that project. But did God give you any special recognition for it? He didn't. I wonder why. That's just too bad. You know, if I was God, I would throw you a banquet. Put in your honor for what you did. It's kind of the way you know Satan just wants to throw little jabs at God. So Satan started his mind games trying to make the angels believe that he should be God and that God was not a God of love who was interested in their welfare. Satan got a third of the angels to buy his life. Can you believe that? They're in heaven with God. And Satan was so deceiving and cunning and deceptive. A third of the angels bought his life. When we look at that, we think, well, how did that happen? Well, one thing I want to ask too is. When that time comes, separation of wheat and tares, the sister says, Sister Twice says, Not one in twenty shall remain. Let's us not buy those lies that he's going to betray. Let's 
but they're so attractive a little bit. Just because the world does. Uh, In the whole universe saw the true character of Satan who was willing to kill anyone who got in the way of being number one. Contrasted with the truth, the character of God was willing to die on the cross. God who was willing to die on the cross and say goodbye to life forever and save others. We know that was Jesus Christ because he knew what Satan had done. This is why Satan does not want us to understand the everlasting gospel that Satan does not want us to understand the everlasting gospel so that we cannot go out and spread the everlasting gospel, which is a free angel's message. Stop and ask your own mind, do you know that the free angel's message of God? Please get to know it because it's on our banner when we go to the flea market. And people may ask you that question, but what is a free angel? But we do have 750 little booklets ordered from 3ABN. It's only 3 ABN message that we will be sharing with people. You know, when we accept God, we accept more than eternal life. We accept God Himself, along with all of His righteousness and goodness and power. To live a victorious life. You know, when you read the second half of that verse, the verse says, and worship him who made heavens and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. It reminds us of the language used in the fourth commandment about the Sabbath. Many times we quote the fourth commandment from Exodus 28 through 11, but let's take a look at it in the book of Deuteronomy. If you will, we're going to look at the book of Deuteronomy. We're going to read. Chapter 5 and verses 12 through 15. Let's show the right chapter here. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy. If the Lord your God commanded you, six days you shall labor. And do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God, and it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And remember that you are a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord, your God, brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord, your God, commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day reminds us we have a creator who did all the work in creating us. It reminds us that we did not make ourselves by our own works. Even more, the Sabbath reminds us that we were redeemed by the works and sacrifice of our Creator and not by our own works. By resting the Sabbath, on the Sabbath, we show that the gospel is practical and not just a theory. It's literally rested and we literally rest our faith in Jesus, believing that He literally saved us. Is the Sabbath day important? Yes, it's important. Very important. Part of the first angel's message. We will go to the second angel's message. Revelation 14, 8. Revelation 14, 8, and another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Many say that Babylon means confusion. Well, it may, but it's, it's not so much confusion about certain doctrines as much as it is about the gospel itself. 
When legalism mixes our works with God's grace, it gets confusing. Again, when legalism mixes our works with God's grace, it gets confusing. In the book of Galatians, chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, not yet I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In Galatians 2.20, Paul gives us the pure gospel and says, Not I, but Christ. I but Christ. So many of us want to make it a combination of me plus Christ. There's an issue with that. The problem is anytime I make me a part of the gospel, I have a corrupt gospel because me is corrupt. Because me is corrupt. I is corrupt. Does this mean do away with the good works? Not at all. It just means realizing that God is who is working in us and not us. Never take the glory away from God. By saying that I did this, I did that. It's God working through you to give the glory to God. Give the glory to God. I know sometimes we'll mistakenly say that, you know, well, I was somewhere and I gave this book out, or I gave this book out, and you know, I kept myself, you know what, I'll pray that God lead me to the people to share his word with. It's God doing it, not me, it's God doing it. God knows whom is seeking for his truth. In the book of Philippians, chapter 2, in verse 13, Philippians 2 13, it says, um, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his pleasure, to do for the pleasure of God, to do for his pleasure. Seventh-day Adventist teaches that Babylon is a religious system, which it is, but it's more than that. It is an attitude. It is an attitude, an attitude that can be found in any system. Babylon is the attitude that I can save myself by my own works. It can never happen. It began with the Tower of Babel. If the, if the Tower of Babel man decided they could not work, decided they could work and build their own way to heaven, they did not think they could trust God to save them from another flood, so they decided to build a tower by their works to save themselves. Thus, Babylon symbolizes salvation by our own works or legalism our own works and legalism. You know, Cain had an attitude of Babylon when he brought the works of his field and offered his own system of worship. But God could only accept Abel's sacrifice, a lamb which pointed to the Lamb of God who could only save. Since then, man has been presenting his own system of worship and even his own day of worship thinking he can save himself by indebting his own religion instead of accepting the gospel. How many times in our life do we want to bring the gospel down to our level instead of elevating our hearts and giving our hearts to Jesus to the level of the gospel of Jesus Christ? And Daniel 1 tells us that God gave Jerusalem into Nebuchadnezzar's hands. But in Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar says, is, 
this is not Babylon which I have made. I have made. And God says, no, I made it give, gave it to you. But there, here's the attitude of Babylon again, that it is my works that save me. He said, which I have made, but God made it and gave it to me. During the dark ages, people were taught that their works could save them. They could buy and work to heaven their way. They were also given a work day to worship instead of the Sabbath day of rest. So they were like Cain, worshiping their works instead of, the, of our Creator and our Redeemer. When the everlasting gospel is proclaimed in all its glory, Babylon will fall. It will fall. Man will see that we are not saved by our own religious works and invention, but rather are saved by the grace of God alone. Saved by the grace of God alone. Sometimes we get in the way. We want recognition for things God has done. It's like when we go out, we plant seeds. The Holy Spirit is the water of these seeds and give them to grow. But sometimes we try to do it ourselves. A lot of times it don't work out to you. But the thing is this, when you plant these seeds, let the love of God be in you. And do it because you love other people. You want to grow the kingdom of God. You know, when we go up to the flea market, yes, we want our congregation to grow. That's not the most important thing to me. The most important thing to me is going to the kingdom of God. Wherever these people, the fleet market are from, Charlotte, Gaston, New Rock, New Fort, New Lancaster, wherever they're from, is grow the kingdom of God. You know, one day, someone's going to come up and maybe say, you know, because God used you to share this with me. I got to know Jesus and had that relationship with wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be awesome? You know, there's times I've shared the word, give out books, and I'm like, well, you know, Lord, I'm going to do this, and whether I'll make it to heaven or not, hopefully they will. Pick this book up, if not today, maybe next week, or next month, or next year. We never know. Or they may share it or just give it to someone else. Someone read this and say, hey, what's this book? I don't know, some crazy man gave me a book from a golf course. Here, you take it. God may use it that way. But now we're going to look at the third angel's message, which encourages us to choose life by exercising our faith in Jesus. See, these messages are was given to the church. We are the ones representing that message, it's supposed to be out spreading this word. The other wise comment, several have written to me inquiring of the, if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in there. Justification by faith. If you are like me, your first glance at the third angel's message does not make you think of justification by faith. As a matter of fact, many people get wrapped up in works over this passage. Let's take another look and see why it's not about works, but rather justification by faith. In Revelation 14, verses 9 through 12, Revelation 14, now through 12. Now the third angel followed in the sand with a loud voice. If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength until the cup of his indignation. 
He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Who worships the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The third angel's message is justification by faith and verity. Because those who refuse the mark of the beast will not be allowed to buy or sell or do any business to provide for themselves or their families. Did you say this going to be a test? They will be resting on the Sabbath and not working. Therefore, they trust God to provide for them and not their own works. You trust God to provide for you and not your own works. This is justification by faith. Those who accept the mark so that they can buy or sell are not resting in Jesus or trusting him to provide for them. Rather, they are saying this. I do not trust Jesus to provide for me, so I am accepting the mark so that I can work and provide for myself. This is salvation by works. Folks, that day is going to come. Many of us, many of God's people will be persecuted. It's just going to be you and Jesus. Not you and your spouse, it's ever for you. You and Jesus. It's very important to notice that the one that accepts the mark and are trying to be saved by their works, this is pretty harsh here, are rejecting the cross of Christ. The cup of his indignation is the cup that Jesus asked to be removed from him in Gethsemane. Those who reject the seal of God and the Sabbath are really Rejecting the cross. How can we ever really reject Christ and the cross? They say, I will accept the mark of the beast and provide my own salvation. When they do this, they reject the salvation provided at Calvary because of their own salvation. Rejecting the salvation provided at Calvary, and instead of letting Jesus drink that cup for them, then they must drink it themselves. After all, if you do not trust Jesus enough to provide your daily bread, but rather accept the mark so that you can do business and put bread on the table yourself, how can you trust Him to provide for your eternal salvation? You're stopping all about that. Could be. You can't trust Jesus to provide for your eternal salvation. You really try to do it yourself and you reject God. So on the other hand, by rejecting the mark, works and keeping the Sabbath instead of God, we accept it. So let me go back on the other hand, by rejecting the mark, the work, and keeping the Sabbath in self God, we are accepting the cross and justification by faith. We are accepting. Jesus drinks the cup mentioned in the third angel's message, so we don't have to. We can all explain with Abraham and Moriah, Jehovah Jireh, my Lord, will provide. Our God will provide if we accept His word is true. My friends, the third angel's message is the climax of the battle between faith and works. For centuries, man has been taught by tradition to save himself by worshiping a man made religion and even a man made Sabbath 
which is Son of God. Those who put their trust in Jesus triumph over the legalism of man-made religions as they rest their faith in the one who gave all to save them. They cherish his Sabbath, which is a sign that we are not saved by works, but rather by his amazing grace. His amazing grace. When we look at the Sabbath, it says cherish the Sabbath, and also cherish all of God's commandments, because they reflect and represent the character of Jesus Christ. Three angels' message exposes Satan's lies and makes God's truth plain so we have all the facts when we make our choice for or against life with Jesus. You know, on the cross, when Jesus said, It is finished, in the mind of Satan, he was thinking, I am finished. I am finished. At that point, when Jesus says, I am, it is finished, you know, he hadn't sent it to the Father yet to make sure his sacrifice was accepted. But he does that. Then he comes back and spends his 40 days with the disciples. Each day we should ask ourselves this. This day, whom do I serve? I pray we choose to surrender daily to the foot of the cross and glorify Jesus with yielding to the guidance of the Holy Spirit to represent the light of the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Folks, we are to be that light. Preach that truth. This, this three angels' message to a lost world. No one else was given no other church to no other people. And the church is people. And I, I will assure you one thing. There is a living God. He created us. Amen. There is a living God that created us. He spoke everything into existence. But you know, is Lucifer was up in heaven with God. Jealousy come in. And again, he wanted to be God, but he didn't want the character of God. So at this in time, my question is this. Do you, do I, we want the character of God not mingled with self? Character of God, not many of the I pray that we each will go forth in our daily life, spread the good news of Jesus Christ, His love. And folks, there's people every day that come into your life or around you. You can just look at them and say, Jesus loves you. You don't know what kind of effect it may be. Never be afraid. Because we serve a wonderful, God loves very much. Loves very much. Let us pray. Lord, Father God, we thank you. Lord, we thank you so much, Lord, for what you've done for us. Father, let us each know, Lord, individually, and as a corporate body, Lord, that we can do nothing of ourselves, Father, but we can only do it through. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Lord, we are called to spread this message to every nation, tribe, people. And Lord, let us be blessed by the Holy Spirit, Lord, to be able to do that. Lord, let us never be afraid of maybe the neighborhood we're going into or the people that we may see that conviction comes upon us. It may feel like we're not worthy enough to do that, Lord. Because Satan always wants us to feel unworthy. 
Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. Lord, just help us to go forward, bringing the true gospel of the good news of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Until that day, even though the times may be rough, but you're coming to take your people home. And Father, you promised you would never put more upon us than we can bear. And we hold on to that, Lord. And let us always believe and know that we are in your precious hands. For it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Messengers, messengers, God has called us to spread a message. Jesus is coming again. Mm -hmm. Please let's stand and sing with me, making number two, thirteen. Jesus is coming again. <laughs> face to face and see your glory. Of course, in your name we pray. 